It's Just Business with Steve Thomas and your host, Chris Larry. Hello and welcome to another episode of It's Just Business on the Hogstein Network, the show where we look at the dollars and the cents of the sports media business industrial complex and all its global complexity. How are you doing today, Steve? I am doing just fine. It's been a wonderful, wonderful day down here in South Texas. How are you up in the, the evil state of New York? Uh, we are lovely and summer is is here and it's a beautiful place to even Did, you, did you go to the Trump rally in Brooklyn? No, I think it was the Bronx, eh? Is um, that all? It's all the same, man. Brooklyn um, and Bronx, what's the difference? Very, very different, Steve. <laughs> um, yeah, even from a historical perspective. Uh, no, I did not. I did not. Apparently, many, not many others did either. Um, it looked like it was huge. What are you talking about? It was a media report. So it was a massive rally, way bigger than what they yeah. thought. You didn't see the backward shots, but whatever. We're not here to debate crowd sizes. Um, <laughs> I'm just giving you a hard time. I don't <laughs> care at all. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I barely even, I, I think I like re- heard about it after the fact, but, uh, but you know, something can be huge and only a blip in New York City. That's why it's so wonderful, Steve. Um, I was in Albuquerque over the last basically few days, uh, lovely town. So anybody listeners out there in Albuquerque, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was almost my home. Oh, really? At one point in time. My father got an assignment to Kirkland, Kirkland Air Force Base, which then got canceled because of an action of Congress. So... Which is a long story I'm not going to get into. Oh, there's there's the origin story for Steve's anti-Congress <laughs> bent. Um, it's right? Some of it, yeah, actually. <laughs> there we go. You know, there's the prequel. Um, I, w- I can't, I would be lying if I said it didn't have something to do with it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is hysterical. F- almost five years in, we, we're, we're uncovering, we're going deep. <laughs> it's one of those like origin story things, you know, like you have on shows. That's yeah, totally. Is. Episode oh, one. Oh. I got a new concert coming up and this one, I already have a ticket. I'm not going to forget about it. You read, this is great. You ready? Sure. Sebastian Bach. <laughs> not, not solo. The, not, yes. Solo. Not Johann Sebastian Bach, the composer who's been dead for what? 300 years. Sebastian Bach, the lead singer of Skid Row. I'm very excited about this. Well, we, we, um, in our household, he actually Sebastian Bach is actually well loved in our household because of his uh, reoccurring role as the uh, on Gilmore Girls as the singer in the uh, town rock band. Gilmore Girls. Oh yeah, he was on Gilmore Girls for four to five years and came back for the Netflix follow up series. I had no idea. I knew he did some kind of. Um broadway thing or something at one point in time because you get so you can say what you want them you can like or just like the music but the dude has got an unbelievable voice uh, and he also know. has a lot of charisma too yeah 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 absolutely so I, no, I he, know it's like gilmore girls yeah like so the, the construct was are these you know basically like teens like early 20 somethings who have like the town band and two of them are married and you know blah blah, blah and sebastian bach is the singer in the band wow how long ago was this that was probably early 2000s. So he was like the creepy 40 year old hanging yeah, on a kind bunch of, of teens. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that was exactly his role. That's probably not too far from life for and him. And he was either. great on it. And he was funny. And sometimes he would like, you know, because they were all kind of like twee nerds and he'd freak out and like kick over a drum or something. And then he would like sheepishly <laughs> apologize. In all my time, I've never known this. I think he probably he probably doesn't want like the hardcore rock guys to really know he was on Gilmore Curls, would be my guess. I guess not, but probably, you know, if you were making a bullet point of his career, it's bullet point three. Yeah. Wow. Who knew? No, but in the be- the best part about this is he's coming to a tiny, tiny bar that's only like five miles from where I live. Oh, that Within is the- fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, is his career gone that far south? I guess it has, but, you know. <laughs> so far south, it's reached Steve. <laughs> exactly <laughs> it's within the radius of my home i don't even have to go downtown houston <laughs> the tightest aperture right like the, the, the sliver of entry then sebastian bach is uh you know sliding underneath like a, a closing trap door and it's probably within 10 miles but still it's yeah it's it's closing in he's going to show up on my front lawn you know next <laughs> wow we're learning so much steve uh, i feel like <laughs> oprah um <laughs> 
<laughs> well, here, uh, this is this is perfect. We'll get you warmed up because I, I know uh, that you're a giant fan of the uh, of the progressive free market uh, that is is exploding in the world of college. Oh, sports. it's oh, absolutely. Of course, it's my, just up my alley. <laughs> Um, so of course we're talking about we're we're a little late because we uh, this it's it's the story's a couple weeks old but it, it, this story is is got multiple it's it's the centipede of legs quite frankly we missed a, we missed a week for logistical reasons and it, so we're a week late with this than we normally would have but no one knows what's going on so this really it's right. is as topical as if we had talked about it two weeks ago in terms of um, basically it was a, lo- a landmark suit that basically has. Um, the colleges, because it's not even, you know, this is where we, it's really funny. This actually is a big step away from the NCAA, I think, is an, you know, another data point towards that. But basically, co- college athletics is getting a payment structure and cost share structure with whoever opt in, I believe, in the world of college athletics. Yeah, so... um First of all, I will say that there are multiple, there's a several different and separate antitrust lawsuits. Some of them have been combined into one lawsuit. That's the one that's that there is a proposed settlement of, but there's another one hanging around out there. I did not have time to pull all these petitions and get really into the nuts and bolts here. So sorry about that. But so what I'm reading here, which is the summary, it's uh, CNBC, NCAA signs off on deal that would change the landscape of college sports. Uh, paying student athletes it's attributed to uh, nobody except the Associated Press and NBC News so um, the gist of it here is that there's the NCAA and the five power conferences uh, meaning the ACC Big Ten Big 12 Pac 12 and SEC have agreed to pay 2.8 billion dollars billion with a B to more than 14,000 former and current student athletes. And that would be the class. Okay. So it's a class action. And the simple version is in federal class action suit in federal court, the court has to first certify the class. And that would be basically if you played college sports in these conferences, more or less. And then the payment, this 2.8 billion gets distributed at through some methodology to these people. Um, and so th- that's the gist of it. But so the big, big deal here is that this is they are expressly stating that it is compensation for work performed for both current and former student athletes. And this is kind of step one towards the professionalization, if you will, of college sports, at least in the power conferences. And believe you me, um the lower tier conferences will soon follow. Otherwise they will not recruit anybody. Um, Now what goes unsaid in here is how this money is going to be distributed. It does not say, for example, does the bowling team get the same, and I'm making that up. I'm being facetious, but something real like the volleyball team, does the volleyball team get an equal distribution as does the football team at Alabama? Um, it, it, it doesn't address that out. It doesn't address Title IX. Uh, you know, is this a Title IX issue? You know, Title IX says universities have to treat, basically treat everybody the same, you know, with between males and females. It doesn't address that at all. There's a lot to go. Um, my instant thought, and, and, and I will say it doesn't, none of this material in here says anything about college athletes being employees. It just says they're going to pay them for, their work well and there'll be revenue sharing based on a revenue sharing models right based on revenue sharing and which incidentally leads one to believe that it would not necessarily be equal between the alabama football team and the alabama tiddlywinks team probably not the same no um, it'd be like an actuary almost levels of degrees of separation about what it's where yeah probably yeah um my instant thought and then i'll shut up is i don't I don't think that this bodes well for the true nature of amateur athletics. And it's, and it's like I said, earlier, I think it's the professionalization of college sports and I, I don't like it. Your thoughts. I mean, it's just all inevitable at this point. So I think what it is, and I think none of the, you know, going, going back to the sort of original, you know, shot heard around the world NIL California uh, situation is, 
we're all heading towards the same place at this point. We're already past that. If that was the massive, you know, kind of detonation, and this one almost to me is a controlled explosion, right? So where, where you know, the, the old, you know, the cities in ruins, the old ways are a smoke and rubble. And the only thing now is to rebuild. And I think you can almost start to see these kinds of lawsuits, which I agree, they don't really address any, you know, even your top 10 complexities on how to do this. None of this gives you any kind of, you know, real answers or, or roadmap is basically just saying, Hey, there's a ginormous pot of money and you're going to continue to lose everywhere this comes up. And so at some point you're going to have to figure out how to do this. And I think if you build forward the, this the results of this lawsuit do actually show where they might go because they're not, they're not going to ever win these cases at this point. And so how do you come up with some way in which you come up with revenue sharing models, which are going to slice and dice it to such a degree that, you know, you're still going to get drips and drabs. If you think about a cla typical class system, upper, middle, lower, what the end result will be. I mean, this is a fat pig. This is a Christmas goose of profit, right? So they're going to carve it up and the upper class is going to continue to get theirs. They may get, they'll have to give up some here. Um, but you know, the big players will still be at the top of that first class. The middle class will expand. And I think your volleyballs of the world and stuff will be in a, in a, a middle class that I think will benefit. And then everybody else is intramurals. Yeah. Um, I, I think you downplayed a little bit the important nature of this. Um, Yes, the first shot was NIL, but what was important about NIL, it was it was not obligating universities to pay anything. This is the first time where the universities themselves are now obligated to pay. And so, well, I agree that was definitely the shot heard around the world. I, I agree with you. This is an equally important step in my view because it's the first time that universities have agreed to pay college athletes, which is anthema. Is that the right word to everything the universities said they would never do? Uh, you know, whereas NAL kind of got forced on them and it was saying, OK, fine, you can go make money. You can go, you know, hawk Marlboro cigarettes and, you know, have a, you know, have a contract. That's fine. We can concede that this is we're now going to share our profits with the athletes. And so I think I don't down, I, I, I don't think we should downplay the importance of that. Yes, I agree. It was inevitable that, that look, people have been suing about this for a long time. We've been over some of these lawsuits on this show over the years. Um, there have been um, many different athletes suing to try to, you know, be treated as employees, um, many, and they've always won. It's kind of like the cigarette industry. They, they won and they won and they won. And all those class action lawsuits until the day they lost. Right, and they now won. it's over. And, and that's I kind of where I what this is. That's kind of what I mean about the NIL part. I agree. Like, but to me, you don't have one without the other in terms of that the the fact that NIL just like was a Pandora's chaos box, right? Of what you know, you just opened it and then who knows? So this to me, considering that the NCAA and the Power Five and whatever conglomeration here is agreeing in, you know, to pay this. It's the NCAA and Power Five is what yeah. it is. So where they lost their leverage when now that much money was injected into the system, it brought them to the table in a way which they, you know, would, knew that they were going to. Then they were talking about how much they'd have to pay in the loss, basically, or how much was settling. And it brought them to the negotiation table to figure this out. In a way that, to your point, decades in the past when they've had, they they could swat this away because there wasn't this amount of money circulating to this large amount of the ecosystem. And after that dam burst, you you know, because I think the universities now are like, well, at least if we have some kind, you know, we you know last when we talked about this issue over the last couple episodes, you know, we talk about how basically major league college athletics has more free agent C than pro sports. You know, and so this to me is them like, OK, well, if we're going to be pay if, if payouts are going out, we need a system. Right. And this this starts to say, OK, so, you you know, it's it's 20 percent of the revenue share or whatever the you can now build models and frameworks of that on top of what they've agreed to or forced to agree to in this lawsuit. And you can start to see the path. And them, I think it does help to. It does help to block some of the NIL gold rush here because it gives them a system that they could build their, you know, quote unquote, free agency or player compensation model around. Yeah. And, and 
you know, I, I think, well, first of all, to be clear, this is not a one-time payment. I mean, the, the column clearly says it's there's the going forward component to it. It's obvious there's going forward. This is forever, okay? This is the dam is burst and, and it's definitely over. And yes, despite my, I, I don't like professionalism and amateur sports. We've, I've said that for a long time. The truth of the matter is, I think it was always going to happen eventually and this I, you just kind of said this it's a way to establish the bounds of reality over it because once you have these payments there can be a system and the other great thing about it it eliminates the hundred dollar handshakes think about all the decades of sponsors with the hundred dollar handshakes the reggie bush you know the agent's gonna buy my parents a car whatever it was brian bosworth some out of nowhere i remember was in sports illustrated years ago driving a corvette where do you, you know where did a college student get a corvette i wonder why you know wonder how that happened all of that can be controlled and that's not a bad thing. Now, I think where I'd like to go with this is what is going to be the impact on the universities? You know, where th this money, the amount of money incoming has not changed. It's sponsorships, TV, radio, media, all of that. And so the universities were taking that and doing stuff with the money. What are the, now that there's a lot less money, is there going to be less, are there going to be less services uh, you know, are they going to need to be raise more money to do this? Is it going to have an impact itself on the university athletic programs? I mean, I mean, <laughs> there's no answer Probably. that isn't yes, right. right on that. We don't know, you know, how, did what degree. All those are obviously, you know, who knows, up for debate, many theories, etc. But you know, there's there's no status quo. It changes is here. Changes is coming. It. I I do believe what the the demarcation line at some point will be what is a sport? And this may be, there may be some choice university and university it might be like a la carte or by conference or by even region, because, you know, different sports have regional popularity and then thus the universities have focused on that. So on and so forth. I think what you'll see is a university will say these sports, they'll cross a line and these sports are in that world, right? There would and, and even yes, maybe if if you know, let's say it's in the the West and and women's volleyball is huge and is a is a legitimate revenue sport in the in that ecosystem, then they're in, right? At, at Cal, you know, that you know, and so there's and so the but and then everything else. And I say this all the time, but it's intramural. I don't just say that as an offhand. I say that it's because where the money comes from. In that scenario, they'll have all kinds of services and 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 activities, but it'll come out of the students, the paycheck in term, not paycheck, in uh, their payment in terms of their student activity fees. Go, go look, if you're paying a college bill or you paid college bills, go look at the breakdown. College activity, and that's all the movie nights and all the other stuff. They'll just take, they'll say, okay, so if you want intramural wrestling somewhere that that's not that popular, you know, or intramural golf or whatever, it's just the student fees will compensate for underwriting, having those services and activities on a college campus. The whole thing will be a la carte, which ones go in that and which ones we have it. And then the others will opt in, you know, use the language of this settlement, will opt in to whatever revenue model shares are decided by this central agency. And we've talked about the death of the NCAA many times. I'll get this may actually give them a pathway because ultimately what college sports needs now, if this is the trend, is better central management, right? Stronger, better central management. And so this may actually lay the ground. Maybe if we call it the NCAA, who knows? But this actually starts to demand, okay, if we're going to do this, then you can't you can't rely on 275 totally free agents out there. And I'm talking about the universities. Yeah, well, yeah, because if you got if y'all don't realize this, the NCAA is a train wreck when it comes to management. It is a total mess. Uh, you know, it's governed. It's ba there is a head. I forget the the title. There is a person who's the head of the NCAA, but he's a figurehead, and it's dominated by the Power Five conferences, and those are dominated by certain university athletic directors, and you know, all kinds of stuff. It is a train wreck in terms of like I'm talking about just like management structure. So if they can come up with something that's more concrete, they're going to have to. If there's billions of dollars at stake. There's going to have to be they a, is because of this lawsuit. <laughs> yeah. And, and the next thing, guess what? There's going to be an employee. There's going to be an athlete union. Now, well, yeah, we've I, already seen those suits. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know. You know, th th there's a, a downside to that. If you're if there's an, a union, that means 
you know, you could be considered employees and, you know, there's the employee being an employee is a two way street, <laughs> you know, and there's also such thing as payroll taxes. If you have employees also, uh, you know, so it gets dramatically more expensive. So I don't know if I'd want to be employees of the universe. I know I, I you know, might rather be a contracted, you know, a contract uh, recipient rather than an employee, but that's neither here nor there, I guess um, for, for right now. Yeah. So, the the future I, I mean one I, I mean you can have a union and it, it can be contract okay it doesn't have they don't have to be employees to have a union and so there that means there's going to be annual negotiations with the athlete union for you you know every few years exactly like the nfl and major league baseball and all of that and they're going to go back and forth on the issues you raise what what about the intramural sports do they deserve to get paid you know like nobody watches the fencing team you know do they deserve to get money just as a by you know you know as the byproduct of being an athlete i mean all of that stuff you know less you know the uh you know the football team at ohio state you know deserves more money i mean all those things are now negotiating points and then what happens is when they can't reach now, when they can't reach agreement, because it, it's a lot easier for like the NFL's deals with 32 teams in one player's union. We're talking about hundreds of universities. Yeah. There's some you states know. that have 32. Yes. It is a <laughs> massive, 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 massive problem. I don't know if anybody fully realizes the scope of what is about to be created with this. I don't know if there is a bigger, larger, more complex employer worker relationship than the in than what they are about to create with the NCA. I mean, maybe you go to like Amazon or something, I guess, you know, maybe that big, but this is massive. A hundred percent. And in, in the fact that, you know, it's always like, then what's look up, right. And there's always a look up scenario in these things. So if, if, if college athletics is this complicated, this big business, what that means is it's still a relatively small fish in the bigger pond, which is what, if, you know, it's turned out to be in the 21st century, one of the United States greatest businesses and that's higher education, right? So like, if you're thinking about, you know, what, what if Americans really perfected to monetize at like max value and that the globe comes, you know, like is a, is actually a global product. Um, it is higher education in America. So, you know, that just show you know, so that, that this is let, this really is a, you know, a cat's cradle. This is layers of complexity and sports is, but a piece of that larger thing. Yeah, and I didn't mean to overlook one one thing you referenced in your previous comments was the athletic fees and whatnot. I the mean, student fees, saying, yeah, the activity fees, fees, yeah, all that is you know what you're saying is they have to pass all this on to the students. And it's going to increase the cost of of you know attending college one way or the other. And sure, you can probably opt into some of it or whatever. But the bottom line is to afford this and still maintain the same level of service in the athletic departments. They're going to have to raise raise fees, which is um, certainly a point of uh, contention in the United States and the federal government has got involved in the executive branch and there's been Supreme court loss, you know, decisions about it and, and controversy and all that. And that is going to get worse because of this. And I would say, so if I, if I'm UCAL, right. So, and I say my, my volleyball program hits these metrics as laid down by the NCAA. Um, it then opts into the rules of that and volleyball is probably sequestered in there somewhere. Okay, great. Then what I say to the fencing team is you, um, I can, and you can show them you would not exist without every student paying the, you know, $125 activity fee. Um, and thus you are governed by the rules of the university, right? You can really make a clear distinction there, right? What's, what's kind of like local control, which is what student activities and services are, 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 are offered. And they make, you know, a university makes those kinds of decisions all the time, right? Like about mm. all kinds of things and has fairly autonomous control, especially in private universities. So, They'll just say that. And so like, the, and they'll say the fencing team, you, you live at the grace of us, you know, so shut up, you know, and you can't, you know, and you, and probably in some ways they, they can control that. Um, and they'll just say, and it'll be very clear where the money comes from. Volleyball team is, is revenue share. Fencing team is, you know, every John and Jane's pocket. Well, I mean, and the, the inevitable problem then with that is basically you're saying if you're a revenue generating sport, you, you're going to be in. And if you're not, you might yeah. not be, but the problem is what are the revenue generating sports, football, 
men's basketball, baseball to a limited extent, to a more limited extent, women's basketball. And, and that has gotten more in the past couple of years with Caitlin Clark and all of that. Um, but it, certainly there's more men's sports than women's sports that are revenue generating. Yeah, Maybe, but that, you know, I, I don't think that's a problem. They'll just figure yeah, out what I, the economies it, of scale are. You you get back what you contribute. They, they'll be I able agree, to but, figure that but out. Dream, but you know, there's a lot of plaintiffs attorneys out there that love to file lawsuits. And, and again, title nine did not contemplate this, uh, you know? And so uh, is it going to be okay under federal law for universities to pay men out more than women? That I, I think that's a, that is a, an unknown question. Now I, your point is, is, you know, it, it, you can easily point to the economics and say this, these are the sports that are, you know, make money in the story. I mean, I get it, but what I'm saying is there are a lot of people who love to file class action lawsuits out there and they're going to allege that, well, you know, federal law says universities have to treat women, women and men the same in, in athletics. How do you do that under this economic model? Yeah. I mean, there's no doubt that there will be many, many challenges to whatever emerges. Um, but this that is also isn't end. unique to the, you know, that's just sort of the, you know, that's partly sort of the world we live in, right? Especially when, you're, is, deal when you're dealing with things in the bees, the billions. Yeah. And this is just the beginning. Uh, you know, yeah. this is not the end. This is step one of the new world. This is, you know, it's like, here's an analogy. Think the Matrix, okay? The very beginning of the first Matrix, Neo notices something's off and everything. And then what's the guy? Is it Samuel Jackson? Whoever the, the tall black guy was in that. He shows no. up. Uh, not, it's so, not Samuel L. Jackson, no. Anyway, the other guy. Uh, the, the, it shows up and says, you can take the red pill or the blue pill. The blue pill, you can go on. And, the red, and, and, and Neo takes the red pill. And then a whole new world is opened. And that's the beginning of the story. This is kind of the red pill, blue pill moment. I think he's, they've now taken the red pill and there's a whole world now that they have to, they have to figure out. And I want people to understand that that is where we are. This is not the end. It is the opening of the story in terms of the solution. It's Lawrence Fishburne, by the way. There, there you um, go, Lawrence Fishburne. So yeah, no, I agree. I mean, th th there's no slowdown of, of the lawsuits. Although the, the to me, what's I think, and, and I agree that this is a will be a monumental one in the kind of like series of of big lawsuits was that this one starts to show you what you know what might make sense and where you know where these things are these these pieces are heading yeah I, and and I think that you have to as you kind of alluded to you have to have local ultimately they're going to local control for this you cannot have some massive clearing house or something that's distributing payments or something like that you that would be like you'd have to have almost a financial institution it had there has to be rules promulgated by somebody then the each university regulates their own program that's the only way it works it, there's not any sort of top-down authoritarian way that's ever going to be it's ever going to work with this in my view i think you have to have pass rules university conforms to the rules and that's the only way you're going to get to work. It's going to be McDonald's. And I, I, yes. in that, I mean that, you know, franchise, franchise talking model, about, you know, yeah. like the, the French fries have to look, feel, taste right. a certain way. You have to use this packaging. You have to use this process, but you know, but the, you know, that, that independent, you know, that owner of that is, is the owner of that franchise. But that, but that. the Fran but McDonald's has a strong organizational leadership with the corporation and the NCA is a train wreck. And so no, but if, it, if this to were to work, you would see a strong, I agree, even if it's just from like an accounting, you know, and, 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 uh, you know, transaction maintenance standpoint, you'll see a stronger entity. If, if, if that model were to be successful at 10 years, we're looking yeah. back at like, <laughs> Oh, you know, this, look at how much this has changed and how it's working, you know, a stronger central uh, business office will be part of that. It has to be, has and, to. and they have to have a stronger central leadership more than what it is. Yeah, you, right. you cannot let the Big Ten and the SEC and certain universities dominate all of this. It's never going to work like that, uh, you know. And, and, and what is and so the trickle down to D two and you know all of that D three, it, it they have to there has to be organized system for this, and they got to get it together soon. I'd say it, at a D3, they'd all be intramural, right? Like it wouldn't be possibly. Like, yeah. It, it, you know, and that, that's still it, to the, the, 
to the to spectator that might not look that much different right or like even to the athlete like and you know because you know that those are pretty small time not that important there for student enrichment things anyway even the college basketball or football team when they have them. So, Which incidentally is the original, yeah. was the original point of college athletics. In the yeah. First and you'll place. see, yeah, you'll see that become, you know, you know sort of artisanal college athletics will be at, you know, would, would, what D3 will be. Yeah. I think we said it. I, I mean, I, I just want people to understand that this is a landmark moment in college sports. I think we're just also just like we, we feel like we get those monthly. So you know, like, <laughs> well, maybe true. There'll be another one <laughs> next month, maybe. But stay tuned for the next landmark moment. Yeah, in right. two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> right, regularly scheduled programming. Um, <laughs> speaking of scheduled programming and how you view it, um, it an interesting lawsuit is moving forward that uh, will finally take a look at at the Sunday ticket package and how it's you know, what it's charged, how you can engage with it, and uh, maybe past uh, and current subscribers like myself may get our recompense. <laughs> He's talking about the NFL direct ticket class action lawsuit. Um, so this is not a new lawsuit. This has been going on since 2015. <laughs> um, I just this morning. Nine like, years. Yeah, like literally five minutes before we went on the air finally got smart and pulled the complaint, the original complaint. And yes, I should have done this earlier. No, I didn't. Sorry. Um, and I'll get to that. But there's also some media stuff. Um, Pro Football Talk has a story on this, which where we originally noticed it. Sunday ticket trial with up to $21 billion at issue gets started. So that's the genesis of the story. So the trial gets started. And this is published by resident idiot Mike Florio. Um, so... First of all, this again, and this lawsuit has been through the gyrations in terms of logistics, and it's a mess. And I'm not going to get into all that because I haven't read it all, but th there's been multiple removal actions and all kinds of stuff. Um, but so this is a class action. Um, and I, what, what you need to understand, well, first of all, the class action is basically is one person alleges damage that may affect the whole group of people. And so the court then certifies the group of people that's affected. Okay. And then a settlement or a trial of a judgment at trial then would be paid out in some formula to all the people. And that's what this is about. And so what the allegation here is that the NFL um, and direct TV are violating federal antitrust laws via their regulation of who is eligible to subscribe to direct TV or to uh, the NFL direct ticket package and under what circumstances. And what they're saying here is that the antitrust violation is that the um, regional nature of how the NCAA or the NFL does their media is a violation. You, you cannot, you could not subscribe to one particular team uh, and there are blackout rules that says, you know, if you live in this, if you live in Cleveland and uh, you know, the Browns game is not sold out, then it's blacked out on direct TV. And, and so the antitrust allegation is not the antitrust allegation is within the universe of the NFL. It's not, they're not saying the NFL itself is, is crushing all their NFL competitors because there isn't any other pro football competitors of any note. So you got to think about this in the realm of NFL media. The antitrust part is that they are claiming the way the direct TV package was set up is the antitrust violation because they are crushing competition by not allowing people to decide what they're subscribing to. So that's basically what the allegation is. And so the trial has started and that's the story. So your thoughts, Chris. Uh, my thoughts are I got to follow up on the link that Steve sent me to see if I can get in this class action suit. You're going to get um, $10. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but I want my $10. So the action item one for me personally. Um, no, I, you know, it's funny that this has been bubbling for nine years because this, this is always the crux of the problem. Right. And, uh, what a, a horrible, I'm not talking, talking about product from a, a delivery technical standpoint, which is its own issue. Um, but I'm talking about that the, they, you know, the sales of every game, every market, et cetera. And then the 
amount of small print and red tape, you know, and, and the, the boondoggle that is that. That's all kind of obvious and they'll figure it out and, and the side of truth and justice could easily lose. But what I find interesting is that I think you know, the current rights holder for this is, is Alphabet slash Google slash YouTube. And I actually think they're rooting pretty hard for the NFL to lose or be or lose enough where they have to kind of change their business model. Cause you know, now, yes, I do not know, but I am making an assertion um, that they would love the ability to itemize this product into all of the kind of differentiated services, you know, is it by week? I get all the games in, in a week with local blackout rules in place or whatever. I'd say that there's some version of that will, that will be persistent. Do I buy a single team pass that, you know, sign me up, Chris Lawrence, that would be, you know, I would love to, you know, pay 175 rather than 375, just get just Washington games. Is it a per game? Is it big game? Is it can, you know, there's all kinds of different models that YouTube, and then that also can make their plus size even either the same price point or similar price point that it is now. Cause they can say, you know, here's the, the food trough version where you just get everything. So I just think YouTube would, you know, because they are the internet, then internet sells itemized things. It wants to slice and dice monetization even deeper across the long tail. So, you know, I understand how YouTube's business models and thinking work, and they would love to be able to kind of break this up. To them, they see that as more money, more revenue streams, but they probably had a hard time considering those old heads in media and the NFL, et cetera, think past this dominance one one service to rule them all mentality, which has been, you know, the status quo and one that has been very profitable. So- I have negotiated advertising deals for and media deals for NFL teams. And not I have not represented the NFL. I've represented two different NFL teams. And the way the NFL has always approached the NFL, for those who don't understand this, the, the, the genesis of all of this is that the NFL controls the broadcast media for every NFL team. NFL teams are not free, do not hold their own broadcast rights. They hold their radio rights, not their t television broadcast rights. And the reason why the NFL does that is simple. It's the NFL believes itself, it, it is so big and so popular <laughs> that they can get away with making, forcing everybody to buy this entire package because they think that people will do it anyway. And they have thus far have been right. Um, there seems to be no um, corner the NFL can turn around that will hurt their popularity. And so they have always felt, and they've always made clear the NFL front off, the NFL will hold the rights and we will do that because we can make more money this way. And so what this, I don't disagree with you, Chris. I think you're right. And and I, I would have a long time, if I could have only signed up for Washington, I would have personally done a long time ago. Uh, you know, um, it, you know, I wouldn't have to watch these, you know, janky websites to, you know, that are not legal to get Washington games here. Um, but th this is another kind of seismic turn. If what, if in my view, sort of a seismic turn they're not what they're not what they will this will not mean is that the nfl will will then hand over the broadcast rights to teams all this means is that they will allow they might have to allow youtube or meta or whoever it is um to break up their packages um so i don't know i mean that is it maybe i misspeak i mean it's not really that seismic um, the seismic would be they allow the Green Bay Packers to sell their own media, and that's not what we're talking about here. But nonetheless, I think it would be a good change for everybody involved. It would be like, welcome to reality, NFL. You are not impenetrable, and you are not so big that you can just give everybody the finger at all times. It's just their history. It's almost like they're being forced to take the medicine that's good for them. 
you know, yes, and that that's exactly right. What happens, and if you know, if that's a trend, and and and, and Alphabet slash Google slash YouTube will will say, you know, first of all, if the stat, if if the NFL were to win, and the NFL package is the NFL pack, the the Directv package is the same status quo, yay. Google's the rights holder. They'll be fine, right? They would. I'm not saying they're like bloodlust rooting for the other side. They're, they're, they're happy with status quo, right? They just they just opt, bought into it a year ago. By all reports, it's done very well. Like they're so that if if if, if the sun comes up tomorrow in the same world, alphabets cool they're all that. still making money, right? But if the NFL is forced to take the medicine that's good for them, alphabets right there to say, "Come here, honey. You know, let me make you feel better. Let me show you how to do this." And they'll and alphabet will be very happy to like hold the NFL's hand into the world that they already should be in. And I think you could probably make a case. I would I would guess that financial analysts probably already have made a case somewhere that they could make more money splitting it up and allowing a bunch of different packages. Look at me. I'll be dupe one, right? So I, I'm currently a dupe. I'll be the next dupe. I'm duped. So I'm paying whatever it is, 290 or whatever, you know, now already. And and now they'll, they'll say, oh, and I'll be, oh, I can just get Washington games and that's only going to cost me one, you know, 150 or 175. Sign me up. I've just saved money, you know, like, you know, bro math. So... <laughs> You know, I'd be excited for that, right? Bro math. Yeah. You know, we have girl math. This is bro was, math. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, but then they're going to nickel and dime me. And I bet you you're right. They've got a financial analyst that say, dupe Chris now just gave us 175. And then by the time he a la carded, right? A la carte is always fake choice. It always usually means more money for who's offering you the Well, now you're going to pay more for getting right. less. Yeah. Now, you know, oh, by, I, by rate as measured at, at, a, at, a, at a rate. I'm going to say, oh, I really want to see Philly, Detroit, because that's an important game. But I'll pay it's not seven in my market. bucks for this. I'll, yeah, yeah, boom. And they've got me at 400, right? Dupe one is now at closer to 400 than 300 in the old plan. And so, yes, I've, 100% they know how to. That's that's where Alphabet can't wait to do this. I would be dupe too, uh, you know, because like thus far, I have refused to pay the whatever it is because I'm cheap and I'm not going to do that. But if it was... If I could just pay a hundred dollars or whatever to just get Washington games, I would feel much better about it. And I would no doubt do it. So I wouldn't have to break the law when I'm watching these games for the hogs thing, you know? And so they would also, they would all, they would drag people like you in, but they would also drag people like me in who just don't, won't do it. And, and if I, if you can give me a smaller choice, I'll give you some money, you know, that I'm not giving you currently. So I bet you, I would love to hear a financial analyst on this because you and I are not financial analysts and we haven't looked at it. We don't have the numbers or anything. I'd be willing to bet. I'd bet anything. I'd bet money that the <laughs> money people have already figured all this out. Yes. And that's why I think they're just sitting there waiting on the sidelines over at Alpha. And a lot of this is like ego at the NFL. Okay. I mean, you got to understand. That is a great point. I, again, have dealt directly with the NFL business people in their front office. There is a ton of ego there. And it's, we are the NFL. We are the 8 million pound gorilla. You're not. Um, if I can, I don't want to repeat it on the air because people know what city I'm in. <laughs> I could tell you some stories about some of like the issues that they have raised are ridiculous, uh, you know, in terms of what they want and what they want you to do and all of that. I don't, I, I don't feel comfortable talking about it on the air but it's it's ego from the nfl perspective we are so big that we will do whatever we want and you will like it and thus far they've more or less been right this is this is one of the few times that they may be put over a chair you know bent over a little bit yeah and like i said i think they'll like it in the end um yeah, I know. It's like punish me more by, you know, allowing me to make more money. It yeah. just if they want to break with their decades old media methodology, they'd be willing to, you know, come a little bit into the 21st century, they'd be willing they'd be they actually make more money. Yeah, I mean the NFL is always a cake and eat it too, plus the brownies, plus the cookies, plus half the ice cream, right? Yes. So, um and but they want their cake and eat it too here is they want the Amazons and the alphabets of the world, right? As business partners, which they are and to large, large success for them. Um, but the alphabets and the Amazons, this isn't how they built empires, right? So, uh, and their event, they're going to start to force this too. And the NFL will realize it's going to have to start to, to, to investigate these things, even with, then we'll see, can they hurt all their ego? I agree. That's probably the number one uh, uh, obstacle. Yeah, and and listen, I mean, a, a lot of cases settle 
especially class actions. But this, I mean, they've actually gotten to trial on this case after nine years of fighting. And we've, I know we've talked about this lawsuit oh, I'm sure, before. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we've done so many stories at this point. I can't remember them all, but um, the idea that a class action lawsuit actually got to trial says everything you need to know about how the NFL treats everything. You know, we're, we're, we're not afraid of this. We're going to go to trial and we're going to win. Now, if you've noticed though, the NFL in recent, like what, 10 years, they've lost a number of things like this. You know, they basically lost on CTE. They had to pay billions of dollars out, uh, you know, and a bunch of related issues like that. Um, they have not won. They used to win everything. It's kind of like what we said earlier about, you know, the cigarette manufacturers we used to win everything until they didn't. That's kind of the NFL here too, a little bit. They used to win everything and they, but they've, they've had to settle some stuff recently. And, and, uh, you know, if they lose this lawsuit, they're going to get a judgment that a bunch of juries going to put together and there's no telling how much that'll be. So y- you could possibly see things can still settle up to the moment. The jury returns a verdict. Wouldn't surprise me very much if this trial goes poorly that all of a sudden they settle because that happens many times. This is the moment in the game of chicken where the two hot rod drivers start to sweat a little. It's like a <laughs> bad Fast and Furious movie. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> where you start to see the the, the brow uh, glisten a little yeah. bit. <laughs> I, you know, there's a talk about a movie series that's gone totally off the rails. I've never seen one moment of any of them. So I've seen about half of them. And the first one was basically just a bunch of street thugs, you know, Vin Diesel and, you know, everything. And Paul Walker was like the, he was like a cop or something or an FBI agent or something. And it was just like a bunch of kids racing the cars around and the cops chasing them. And it has turned into like this ring of international CA contractors driving Ferraris in the Antarctica to stop the world from blowing up. It's gone so far off the rails. They really need to stop. But that's another story for another podcast. Uh, well, apparently they, they don't literally, need to stop because they must, they must make money. Chris, they literally, in a couple of... Sh- I, I quit watching them. I couldn't take anymore. But one of them, like, I don't know, two or three movies ago, they literally airdropped Lamborghinis out of an airplane into the Antarctica. <laughs> I mean, they literally, that's literally what happened. Maybe it was the Arctic. Don't quote me in Arctic or Arctic, one of the two, <laughs> you know, and it's just the most, they, they one the la- the movie that really turned me off, they, somebody, the bad guy invented this like giant magnet thing where it would suck every car, out, you know, into the street. And so they, he just pressed a button. The bad guy did. It might've been a woman. The bad guy pressed a button and it was sucking all these cars out of like parking garages and off of roofs and stuff. And it's just, you know, we go from like a bunch of thugs driving cars around being chased by the police or by the FBI to that. It's just, they need to stop. That, that could have been the, the moment finally for the Soviet era East German uh, cardboard car. <laughs> yeah, that, that thing's sure to go wrong. <laughs> Anyways, um, so I didn't mean to get down the Fast and Furious road here, but but anyway, so the moral of the story for the NFL story here is that it's pretty unusual for class action go to trial. It's all about the NFL's ego. Um, we all we both think that this is be much better for, for the consumer and ultimately better for the NFL if they can get over themselves and just allow this to happen. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see. I mean, it looks like the NFL is willing to fight it this far. So it still may not be, you know, the end is not necessarily in sight, but maybe I'll get 1199 instead of 999. Yes. <laughs> uh, our last story here is a, it's a bit of a check-in uh, and we're in this one, we're re- referencing an athletic article by Brody Miller, who I believe we've referenced in the past. Will the PGA Tour, PIF, make a deal a year later? It's still uncertain. So basically, this is checking in on where we are at the sort of year mark um, of the, you know, kind of framework for agreement towards a chance to partner that may think about a new way forward agreement that was signed a year ago between Liv and the PGA and and really what this article details as a sort of headline level is that there's been a lot of infighting, back channel negotiations, maybe ifs, but no real progress on any of the key issues in that year. Yeah. So we did a story a year or so ago. That it was a big deal. It was the PGA and PIF is the owners of Live Golf. So 
PIF is the uh, something investment fund and that is controlled. It's controlled by the Saudi investment fund. And so the yeah. controversy was always the Saudis, which have uh, issues with human rights. And that's what the original. That's in the rear view. No one even talks about it. Anymore. Yeah, no, I know. But um, anyway, so that was the controversy we've got. But a year or so ago that, you know, the story came out that there was kind of an agreement in principle between the PGA and Live Golf, wherein they were going to, you know, put hands together and sing Kumbaya kind of like in an AFC NFC sort of more, more like probably realistically, um, uh, you know, the way the major league baseball used to be, you know, with American league and national league kind of structure. They basically agreed not to sue each other for a year. Yeah. And then they would have, you know, basically a common organization to kind of run global golf. Well, then it just totally fell aside. We didn't hear a word about it at all. We didn't know what the status was or anything. And this story here that Chris cited, this is from The Athletic, right? Yeah. It goes into some detail about things that we didn't know about. Um, number one, there's been a pretty big amount of controversy in the leadership of the PGA Tour. Uh, you know, Jay Monahan was the commissioner. Um you know, he was out and then he's back in. You know, Rory McElroy was was a spokesman and he was out, he's back in. Tiger Woods is out and in. Um, but the bot- but the bottom line, there's something called the T- PGA Tour Policy Board. They're the ones that are controlling everything. They're the ones trying to negotiate with Live Golf. And it really hasn't, it doesn't sound like sounds like what happened is they did reach kind of like the LOI stage, basically, for those yeah. of you know what I'm talking about. They kind of had a letter of intent, basically, like a broad outline of where they could go and then nothing's happened not, not, not nothing no further detailed agreements have happened to put it together where those two entities would control global golf the only thing and, they've really agreed on is when to extend deadlines yes they they keep giving themselves more and more deadlines yeah. you know because they can't agree on anything and part of the problem again is that there's been a massive amount of controversy in the pga apparently the pga was doing a lot of this without like involving the members you know, meaning the tour members, because um, the PGA is not just a private corporation. It's some sort of loose business association run by this policy board. And, you know, the tour people are supposed to share in the profits. It's not, it's complicated. Um, and so what this story lays out here is that it, we, it's still not in any way clear whether live golf and the PGA are ever going to actually get formal, formalize a formal agreement. In fact, you could say that they're some of your strongest data points are or are that the opposite, that they're continuing to calcify into separate leagues, no agreement. Um, and that is that you had a, you know, I don't have the name right in front of me, but you had another probably but was ranked as a number two golfer in the PGA jump. So you have had Rom, one Rom. Rom, yes. Yeah. So you have had one high level defection in that year of detente. So that was a still a, a pretty big blow um, on the PGA side. You're right. This 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 board, this governing board, expanded their player seats, and then that's where the, the McElroys and the Spieths and the um, Wood, Tiger Woods. Woods. Yeah. yeah. So you, the players have more power, but then also what players? And then there's been shakeups there, and the PGA has continued to be hard line on crossover. So in some ways, the lines in the sand have actually gotten a little bit more stark in this year, which makes everything else more complicated. The inside this article makes very clear that if you are still an insider on either side of the fence, so it means you're still sitting at whatever negotiating table there is, you have a more rosy outlook. Everybody who's been inside and is now on the outside or has gone back and forth a few times is really raising the alarm bells. And so um, what happens? I think this article suggests that we're actually a little further away than we may have been in a year ago, where at least the, the vibes were better. Oh, I definitely think that. And the other key point here that the that the column, the article mentions, is that uh, one of the major um, negotiating, uh, you know, like negotiating, is all about leverage. Okay, business negotiation. And one of the the key leverage points that Live Golf had was the money. They had Saudi oil money, 
because that's what the Saudi investment fund is, the Saudi Arabian government's official investment vehicle. All that money comes from oil because the Saudi government has not privatized the oil industry. They own all of it. And so that's where that's why Saudi Arabia has so much money. Well, the article mentions that the PGA Tour now has backing from something called the Strategic Sports Group, which I've never heard of. But according to this column, it's a consortium of major sports investors, major investors in professional sports like John Henry, Arthur Blank, and Steve Cohen, among others. And so um, what this column says is the challenge of this investment was understanding if, if that move, strategic sports group, if it signaled a move towards a deal or a move towards ensuring that didn't actually need Saudi money. Some argued it was the tour pushing PIF, which is the owning entity of Live Golf, out. You know, because it's like, fine, you know, we can find billionaires too. If you're not going to play ball with us, we'll go find our own billionaires. And that's exactly what they have done. So now can strategic sports group, which will have major leverage inside the PGA, do they even want or need to play with live golf? And by the way, I'd like to point out, this is anecdotal. Okay. But I watched a little bit of a live golf tournament this weekend on TV. There was nobody there. Okay. I mean, there were a few people there. I'm being facetious, but you know, like if you go to like a major PGA tour, Stop. There's thousands of people. There, there were not a ton of people at this. It was the stop in Houston. It happened to be the Houston tournament. And, and so I don't know if, despite the Saudi oil money, are they really making money on this thing? And if they aren't, then maybe the PGA says, we, we don't need you. We've got our billionaires here. You know, you can be flashy, but you're not actually that pop, that pop, and we don't need you. I think they're definitely, you know, speaking of, of games of chicken, um, on, on a similar basically path. what it is yeah yeah there, this is fast and the furious uh, 22 here <laughs> a as golf well. version of fast and the yeah. furious <laughs> um what i did find interesting if you want to look for uh, if you want to look for a ray of light um i did think the article does a good job of actually outlining where there probably is consensus and a probable path forward and that is in that kind of afc you know nfc or nfl sorry nfl afl model in, in that you will see a truncated shared tour that crowns a, a global glo- golf champion. And it sounds like in the article, it's just a couple of holdouts on the PGA side that are, you know, they're spitting in the wind. They'll, they'll lose that kind of almost, you know, they're kind of there. There's a moral stand on that one um, eventually. And that will see something that, does a red team versus blue team type of thing for a section of the year and brings those tournaments to a more global market. I think uh, that I think is where this will end up. And then like anything else, if that becomes so big that you need a, you know, like you move from the AFL uh, NFL to the NFC AFC model, that could definitely be a path. But I think in the next couple of years that the positive version of announcement off this will be some kind of shared tour and champion. Yeah. That would mean that the players that defected to live golf would be invited back at some level in some capacity. PGA right. and the US and British open are part of that champions tour. Yeah. Right. I mean, and some, some are oh, like the masters is not part of it, but, but, but the PGA tour stops in the live golf stops would basically have kind of the same players you know, within, you know, more or less. Yeah. And that would be good for ratings for everybody because, you know, if you couldn't distinguish, like people are going to want, you know, people have their favorite players, you know, Phil Mickelson or whoever is your favorite player, you're going to watch Phil. And I don't know if you'd so much care whether it's a live, a live tour stop or a PGA stop, because it would all look the same. It looked like professional golf, the same players, which you've always watched. And that would be better for everybody, I think. And so that's what you're talking about is that, and again, whether they can get together or not, you know, is another story because right now it looks like they're pretty far apart. I mean, this article, go, we're not going to repeat all these details here, but it goes into like, you know, they're having meetings at Tiger Woods' house to negotiate. Yeah, in the Bahamas, and, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> and he also down lives in Jupiter, Florida, I think, too. And I didn't really say where, where, but um, anyway, I mean, so there are meetings and stuff. They just haven't gotten it together. These deals are big and complicated, and it's made way worse by the fact that. Saudi Arabian government is what 9,000 miles away or whatever it is, uh, you know, and difficult to deal with. Uh, yeah. And the, the one thing, the article that the, the did say that this sounded like there was a, you know, there was a broad consensus that that, you know, that there was, that, that was a thing that like, you know, had as many people like, okay, maybe than anything else. And it would be a no brainer. I mean, could you imagine oh, yeah. like 10 tournaments global 
four or five of those are ones that every even non-golf fans probably would recognize just at the name. And then the other ones are in some new locales or whatever. And, you know, you get 50 from both tours or whatever that, you know, however you and then that means qualifying at those, in, you know, within the those two the live and the PGA tour is even more important because you're looking to qualify for the champions round. Right. And then when you get into the champions round and you have these mega tournaments and then you have a grand champion, I mean, that that would be I mean, oh, it'd be great. It would be huge. And there's a whole international market that golf kind of hasn't tapped into yet. Also. Right. This would be this would be the open for business for that. Yeah. I mean, because there are like there are tour stops in Europe. They do do some like in, in the Asian Pacific area. There's some like in the Middle East and but none of that stuff. Those are all localized. You know, I mean, the British Open and the Masters are probably broadcast everywhere. But but having it all in kind of one big program it would be better for, you know, then like we in America would watch like the, you know, the Prague golf tournament or whatever. I'm making stuff up, but yeah, if it was I, part of the champion. Right. League, exactly. Yeah. Or the, the Tokyo, would, yeah. the Tokyo open or whatever. Yeah. It probably even drives European and North American audiences towards the live or if, or because if you're like, oh, these are the last two tournaments in the PIF tour is going to shake out who goes to the champions round, that will also start to dry. I mean, that's more golf heads, right? But that's they're always looking to expand. You're always looking to, you know, upsell, push them through the funnel, right? You go from like golf curious to like yeah. golf. And then, you know, so that's that's where they want to push these people anyway. You'd even draw interest in in those separate tours. And you'd have a time, you know, problem in the United States, but I mean, we've seen that in the Olympics and there's ways yeah. around it and you just have to drive interest. Right. Yeah. The nerds will find it. Um, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> golf nerds will find it. Right. And they want to expand who identifies as a golf nerd. Um, well, all right, Steve, well, this is a, some big, you know, kind of our, our, you know, kind of our lead off lineup of stories. If you were to them. <laughs> Some shows we have to struggle to come up with like what is interesting and useful. This is not one of those shows. <laughs> yes. No. Uh, so three big stories, sort of all some sizable updates uh, or at least new information on that. Uh, so, you, you know, you're almost at the blessed month of July where everyone can hit the hogs. I can take a break, I assume. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> We're heading in about heading into the slow into the the slow time of the year. We uh, of course are doing our position group breakdowns, you know, and that kind of leads up to training camp, which is at the end of July. We will try to get back to training camp again this year. Now that Dan Snyder's out, and they don't hate us anymore at the Hogsty because we made fun of Dan Snyder too much. So we'll see. But uh, yeah, we're about to go into the slow period. Uh, and then we'll ramp back up. We have shows that are released every Thursday and then all of our regular written content. Has Alex done the top seven UFL kickers to watch column yet? Well, no, but he was about to. He had a couple names. It's like, I don't know who you're talking about. I'll take your word for it. You're the only one who knows who this person is. <laughs> including and that's just not paying attention to the alternate league. That's following the special team storylines of the alternative league. Alex, for those of you who aren't aware, Alex is the biggest special teams nerd in on the face of the earth. Like it combines, it combines his two favorite things, right? Like startup pro football uh leagues and special teams yes yes exactly right <laughs> so he was like all over the uh brandon mcmanus got cut not like what i was interested in and what's the case and you know all that it was for him it was like we're gonna have to hunt through ufl punters and he or kickers and he did do that he had yeah. names yeah i'm sure he did <laughs> um all right so uh maybe he'll get to take a victory lap when one of those kickers kicks a game-winning field goal in the 2024 uh, upcoming season or misses a 39 yard or one of the two right yeah it, it'd be <laughs> part of the part of the narrative all right exactly. steve uh we will see you all in two weeks <laughs>